Well, to begin with, I'm going to talk a little about the Martha Stewart case. And don't get worried if you're sick of hearing about the Martha Stewart case. If 24 hours is all you can take of it, 24 hours nonstop, I do want to assure you and guarantee you that what you're going to hear in the next few minutes is not going to be like anything you have heard in the last 24 hours. I am not going to tell you the same things that you've heard on MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News. I think that the Martha Stewart guilty verdict is more than a little troubling. It is an outrage. And the very case itself typifies what's going on today in America, where we have a government that is free to intrude in any area of your life, free to make up the rules as it goes along, free to allow prosecutors to make names for themselves in high-profile cases without ever having to face any personal consequences, no matter what harm they do. The man who instigated this case, James Comey, who indicted Martha Stewart last summer, has now been promoted to be the number two man in the Justice Department behind John Ashcroft. It was a real career maker for him, and you wonder why these people do these things. You have the same thing with Kobe Bryant in Colorado. I can almost guarantee you that the guy who's prosecuting the case is going to run for state attorney general sometime very soon. Now, let me make it clear. I don't know Martha Stewart. I've never seen her TV show. I've never read any of her books or magazines. I have no idea what kind of person she is personally. And, of course, I don't believe anything that people have been saying about her on television. She may be much worse. She may be much better than what they say because no one is ever as bad as the press makes them out to be. No one is ever as good as the press makes them out to be. So I don't really care about Martha Stewart personally because I don't know her. But I do care deeply about the kind of country America has turned into, one in which there is no longer any rule of law and anyone can be prosecuted at any time for any kind of offense that the government wants to invent for the occasion. Now, the first thing we have to ask is, what was Martha Stewart guilty of? Whom has she harmed? What is she supposed to have done that warrants sending her to prison? Whose property did she intrude on? Whose person did she violate? The answer is, no one, nothing, nada. The entire case arose because the prosecutor claims that she sold her in-clone stock on a so-called inside tip when her broker told her that the head of in-clone was selling his stock. So what? What if she did act on insider information? Is that any more unfair than some other investor out there in the world having a bigger computer than you have, having enough money to subscribe to more investment tip sheets than you have the money to subscribe to, some investor out there being smarter and more perceptive than you are? Of course there are advantages that some people have over others, and if you want to get rid of them all, then what you have is a totalitarian police state also known as the Soviet Union. Is that what you want for America, to level the playing field to the point where none of us has anything anymore and we are all dependent upon the state for everything that we get? Since when is it a crime in America to use your wits, your knowledge, your talents, and, yes, your contacts to make money? Although everyone in the courtroom for the Stewart trial and everyone talking about it on television assumes that there's something evil about so-called insider trading, the truth is that it is a victimless crime. There is no victim. Oh, yes, I know that it seems obvious that all kinds of people were hurt in some way, people who owned m stock or were going to buy it or were going to sell it or whatever it is. But I can guarantee you there is no one who is worse off because Martha, Clo- uh, Martha Stewart sold her stock on a tip from her stockbroker, if that's what really happened. The fact of the matter is that nobody is hurt by insider trading. I don't claim that it's a benefit, but nobody is hurt by it. And on my Radio Links page, I have a very lengthy article examining all the arguments against insider trading and pointing out that they are all empty. I explained all of this that insider trading is a crime without a victim. And since there's no victim, insider trading is really a crime against the state, and only the state. It's the same kind of crime as using recreational drugs or doing business with someone in a way that pleases everybody concerned, but displeases some politician or bureaucratic idiot who has no idea what he's doing. And speaking of not knowing what he's doing, there was a juror named Chapel Hartridge, who has appeared on television many times in the last 24 hours, proudly telling us that the Stewart guilty verdict sends a message. Oh, I love that. Sends a message that the investment markets will be safer for the little investor. And I have an exact quote from him. Maybe it's a victory for the little guys who lose money in the market because of these kinds of transactions. End of quote. Well, i got to tell you, this man hasn't the faintest idea how the investment markets work. And most likely there wasn't a single person in that courtroom, on the jury, on the prosecution, on the defense, the judge, the spectators, not a single person in the courtroom who knows how the investment markets work. And yet these people on the jury held the life of Martha Stewart in their hands. The prosecution also charged Martha Stewart with lying to government investigators. Again, so what? Just imagine for a moment how you would feel if you discovered that the full weight of the United States government with its millions and millions of dollars to spend on prosecutions was going to be used to prosecute you for something. Most likely, you'd be scared to death. Imagine, you're about to be put in prison for several years, lose your life savings, uh, be separated from your family, lose your career. Your whole life is possibly about to crumble. 
And in this kind of a situation, barely able to keep your emotions in check, if you saw the chance to beat the rap by telling a lie or doctoring some evidence, you'd have a huge incentive to do so, even if you were innocent. And that's the point. People lie in situations like that because they are scared to death and they will do whatever they can to try to get this enormous monster out of their lives. It's a perfectly natural act. But now, it's a crime. And the prosecutor in the Martha Stewart case smugly told the television audience that the guilty verdict, wait for it, here it comes, sends a message that lying to government employees will get you prison time. God, I wish these people would put their messages in bottles and drop them in the ocean. I'm tired of hearing them. Of course, government employees lie to you all the time. But, of course, when they lie, they don't get prison time. They get promotions. Another charge? Conspiracy. Conspiracy to do what? Conspiracy to do what the other charges were. The whole concept of conspiracy crimes makes no sense whatsoever. Look, suppose you rob somebody of, a hundred, uh, let's say, a thousand dollars. You rob somebody of a thousand dollars, then you're guilty of robbery. If you and I together rob that person of a thousand dollars, we're both guilty of robbery. Very simple, right? And the victim is no worse off because there were two of us than if you had done it by yourself. But in today's Alice in Wonderland legal system, we're not just guilty of robbery, we're also guilty of conspiring to rob because we're so inept that it took two of us to do the robbery instead of one. Now, I know this sounds like a Pollock joke, but it's really serious business. In other words, conspiracy is a meaningless crime. It is just repeating the initial crime that's been charged anyway. And why do they add conspiracy to it? Because the more charges they can pile up against you, the more they've got to bargain with. If they can pile up a dozen charges against you, then they can negotiate to cut it down to six or to three or to two or to one if you'll plead guilty and put another scalp on their belt. So, here we have Martha Stewart, indicted on three different meaningless concepts. Selling some stock because someone told her an insider was selling. Lying to investigators. Conspiring with someone else to lie to investigators. Now, what really happened in the courtroom? To defend herself, Martha Stewart claimed the stock was sold, the stock was sold because of a previously entered stop-loss order. Stop-loss is an instruction to the broker to sell the stock whenever it fell to $60. The general response to Stewart's claim was a collective horse laugh. Oh, yeah, of course that, that's the case. Oh, and she doctored some evidence. She, she uh, cut, wrote, no, she didn't, the broker, you know, he wrote something in a different ink than from what he had written before, and she told her uh, assistant to change the phone logs, and then she said, no, don't do that, change them back again, and so on. It goes on and on. The jury decided that she wasn't telling the truth, that she had lied when she told the government investigators about the stop loss. Now, did she lie or didn't she? Let's see when we come back from this break. This is Harry Brown. Stay with me. As we left our little drama here, going to the break, I said that the jury decided that she wasn't telling the truth about the stop loss, that she lied when she told the government investigators that she sold her stock at $60 because it was a prearranged stop loss. All right, was she telling the truth? I have no idea. Neither do you, neither do the jurors, neither does the judge, and neither do the prosecutors. Nobody knows except Martha Stewart and her broker whether it is true. The fact that she told a lie about something related to it means nothing. She was looking for a way out of her dilemma. There was no hard evidence of any kind that she lied. And so the jurors can't possibly say that they know she's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Anyone can suspect that he knows what happened. But a lot of innocent people have gone to prison on such suspicions. The whole case came down to the testimony of Douglas Faniel, a broker's assistant who claims that his boss the co-defendant in the case, told him to call Martha Stewart and tell her the head of M-Clone was selling and that she ought to sell too. Now, you may not be aware of this because I didn't hear a single person mention it during the last 24 hours. But the fact is that Douglas Faniel originally said there was a stop-loss order, and neither Martha Stewart nor Faniel's boss, Peter Bakanovich, the broker, did anything wrong. Now, what caused him to change his story? The government charged him with being a participant in this venal conspiracy. He was originally a defendant in the case. Now, not surprisingly, Faniel then decided to change his story. And again, not surprisingly, the charges against Faniel were dropped. Wow, what a coincidence. So the main thrust of the case against Martha Stewart rested on the testimony of a man who changed his story in order to free himself from the wrath of the United States government. And as I said, it's interesting that none of the news reports I read or heard after the guilty verdict mentioned that the star witness had traded his testimony for his freedom. So here we are in modern America, a place where anyone can be charged with anything, and if there's no law against what you've done, the prosecutor can call it conspiracy, uh, obstruction of justice, or just plain lying to investigators because you claimed to be innocent, and that was a lie, at least in the minds of the investigators. 
One of the very saddest things of the last 24 hours is that those few people who have come forward to speak on behalf of Martha Stewart have compared her with corporate executives whom they say did far worse than Martha Stewart, that Martha Stewart's alleged crimes were a drop in the bucket compared to what Dennis Kozlowski and the Enron people and WorldCom and all these people did. Well, we have come to the point that where, aside from Saddam Hussein, the devil of the day right now is the corporate executive. Many of these businessmen who are being charged with bilking their stockholders or doing other crimes have been playing by the very rules that were set down by the government. But those rules aren't rules of law. They're rules of men, and they can be changed at a moment's notice. And what was legal and, in fact, compulsory yesterday can be prohibited and illegal today. TV commentators continually go tisk tisk about the heinous crimes that have supposedly been committed by corporate executives. And George Bush reminds us periodically that CEOs have been cooking the books, as he likes to put it. But the truth is that neither George Bush, the TV commentators, you nor I have the faintest idea how those books were kept. We don't know what in the world happened. And we don't even know how they should have been kept because we are in over our heads there. We don't have any idea of what was going on in those companies or how those particular bookkeeping transactions worked. All we know are the stories that self-serving government employees have fed to us. For a good example of this, I heard Fox commentator Bill O'Reilly a few months ago say that Dennis Kozlowski of the Tyco case should get 20 years in prison. But all Bill O'Reilly knows about the case is what the government has told the press and the TV networks. And the interesting thing was that in the very same interview where he said this, he mentioned that he had owned Tyco stock and that he had made money on it, that Dennis Kozlowski had made money for him. And Bill O'Reilly thanks him by saying that Kozlowski ought to get 20 years in prison. Prosecutors make names for themselves by indicting high-profile people and then padding their conviction records, and that's very easy to do. All they have to do is to indict someone for a dozen crimes and then offer to drop two-thirds of them if the defendant will plead guilty to the remaining charges, as I mentioned before. As I was saying, the corporate executives are really taking it in the neck these days, and it really does pain me, and it outrages me, to see these continual pictures on television, especially during the last 24 hours, of corporate executives being led out of their offices by federal policemen, whether they're plain clothes or in uniform, and the corporate executives are in handcuffs. These people have not been charged with committing violence against anybody. They are not flight risks. They are not likely to pull a gun and try to shoot somebody, and yet they are being let out in handcuffs purely for effect. And I've also seen some outrageous statements on television about the only sad thing about all of this is that for everyone who is captured and charged, 20 of them get away. But who started all this business of leading people out of their offices in handcuffs and making such high-profile cases such a big deal. Well, you'd be surprised maybe to know that this all began back in the 1970s with a U.S. attorney named Rudolph Giuliani. Yeah, that's right, Rudolph Giuliani, the hero du jour, the man who saved New York after the 9-11 bombing, the man who cleaned up crime in New York City and so on, and who is often touted to replace Dick Cheney to, um, to be on the ticket this year with George Bush as his vice presidential candidate and probably will be touted for a presidential nomination in four years if Bush loses this year or whether he wins, either, either way, I guess. Now, let's wind this up by asking what all this means to you. It isn't just the high-profile cases. Anyone can be grist for a prosecutor's mill, for a prosecutor's conviction record. The drug war, for example, has provided a bonanza for U.S. attorneys. Getting a conviction on drug charges is a slam dunk. The defendant doesn't have to, to have dealt drugs or even to have used them. Just charge him, scare him to death, and get him to plead guilty to a lesser charge. Or promise someone who has been caught a lighter sentence if he'll name a bunch of other people, with no concern for whether those other people are guilty or innocent. The November Coalition has documented scores of these cases, and I've discussed some of them on this program. So I'm outraged by the Martha Stewart case, as you can see. She probably will go to prison on invented charges and suspect evidence. And I think the thing to be learned about all these is that what we know about these cases is only what the government wants us to know, what the government claims. Just as with the Iraqi situation, everything we think we know actually originates with some government employee leaking the so-called truth to people in the press who dutifully report these planted claims as facts. There is such ignorance in the press, for instance, about how the financial markets work, but they speak with such authority. They speak as though everything they're stating is an absolute uncontested fact. And the lesson politically in this is that politicians have to be constrained. Thomas Jefferson, for instance, wanted America to be an agrarian society, 
but he didn't use the power of his office to aid farmers at the expense of commercial interests. He knew that politicians must be, as he put it, bound down by the chains of the Constitution. And this is why the Founding Fathers were, were, were determined that the federal government should have nothing whatsoever to do with such matters as business dealings. They knew that government officials armed with threats of fines and imprisonment would have inevitably abused such powers. You can't give people this kind of power and not expect them to use it for their own advancement, for their own profit, for their own benefits in whatever way. And today the guns of the government are available to politicians and bureaucrats to force you and me to conduct our lives in whatever way they want, in whatever way such paragons of virtue as George Bush and John Kerry would want us to live. It has reached the point where nothing is a matter of persuasion anymore. Everything is a criminal matter to be settled, to be subject, to be imposed by fines and imprisonment. And we have reached the point where whatever isn't compulsory is prohibited. Well, let's see what J.P. in Tallahassee thinks about all this. J.P., are you with us? I'm with you, Harry. Sorry to keep you waiting so long, but I had a lot to say. Yeah, that's okay, Harry. I always love hearing it. It's, it's an honor to talk to you, the, uh, the man who introduced me to libertarianism, and I look forward to meeting you in Orlando. So. Oh, good. Um, well, I just uh, wanted to touch on a couple of things. First, about the Marcus Sewell. You mentioned Giuliani. Giuliani, uh, when he started uh, dragging in all these white-collar criminals and used the RICO statutes mostly, which was originally uh, designed to fight organized crime and drugs, but he ended up using it to drag uh, white-collar criminals to jail. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, that just goes to show you right there that uh, how, how things can be, how laws, you always say how laws can be used by the government one way or another to, for whatever purpose they wanted to. There's a perfect example. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you've talked about RICO laws before, so. Um, the second thing is, is that I think right now what's coming with, I, I don't know how it's been throughout history. Uh, I'm 29 years old, so I don't know how it was 50 years ago, but I think there's a dumbing down uh, in America as far as people only seeing things as black and white, um, as good and evil. And I think a lot of times people... People think that if somebody's rich, they got that way through cheating somebody else. So it's mm -hmm. almost like when they finally, you know, get theirs, quote unquote, they, it's almost like they deserved it. So it doesn't really matter the charges against them. It's what they feel is fair or not fair to somebody. Oh well, he, he or she is rich; they deserve it. You know, they probably cheated somebody, and that, that's what they get what they deserve. So yeah, you're, I, you're you're making a good point. And of course, it's true that some of these people did get rich through what we would consider cheating, meaning they got it through the government. They got it by using the government to outlaw their competitors, or they used it uh, used the government to provide all kinds of subsidies to them, or whatever it may be, and those kind of people are quite different from people like Martha Stewart and others who built enormous companies that employed many, many people and provided great satisfaction to millions of people in the country and who had, in effect, done as good works as you can possibly imagine from someone, even if they were doing it for their own profit. And, of course, nobody makes the distinction between those who got rich through the government and those who got rich by treating other people the way they wanted to be treated. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. I don't can, I can agree with you more. But uh, if I could just touch on another subject really quickly, other than sure. Martha Stewart, I ran into this article um, from the Wall Street Journal that just, uh, I mean, just struck me over here. And I've never heard you talk about this particular subject, um, the the USDA's uh, pyramid of foods. Um, with this whole Atkins diet thing coming, all these uh, low carb diets, more and more science is finding that carbohydrates do cause obesity. I'm just going to read here this uh, Wall Street Journal article. Uh, it says, with obesity reaching epidemic proportions in the U.S., some critics say it's, government, it's the government's food pyramid that should go on a diet. Uh, <laughs> the pyramid pictorially reflects the USDA's guidelines on what Americans should eat every day to maintain a healthy weight. From a broad base of 6 to 11 servings of grains and carbohydrates, the pyramid narrows upwards for fruits and vegetables and then milk and meat and then finally uh, saying eat sparingly candy. So the thing is, is that the, the, the pyramid... Um, and it says right here also, uh, it's no coincidence that the number of overweight Americans has risen 61% since the pyramid was introduced and, <laughs> and almost instant instantaneously appeared on the side of pasta boxes, bread wrappers, and packages of other food products in the pyramid 6 to 11 servings category. Now, I was in the supermarket today, and if you look, sure enough, if you look on the side of a, of a white bread, um, which you'll see there, the, the USDA pyramid is found that you need to be eating as much of this as yeah. much bread as possible. And we're finding now that these white, that these, these processed foods, these processed breads that are causing the, so, the, the obesity epidemic, uh, the processed pasta and things like that, people are eating so much of it endorsed by the government. And, and I think it really, it really does have a lot and a lot to do with the rising obesity rate in this country. So here's another example of the government trying to do something good and it just has been completely opposite effect. And it, and, yeah. and, you know, and then what do they do? They blame, they end up blaming McDonald's and other things, but oh, yeah. have just as much responsibility in this problem as any other company does. Well, the principle at work here, too, is that this is today's view, and we are all being forced to pay for it. We, Our taxes are what created that pyramid. Our taxes are what created uh, the possibility to disseminate this far and wide across the country. And tomorrow, they will say just the opposite, that that's no longer the prevailing wisdom. And so now they must force some other wisdom on us that may be diametrically opposed to what they're telling us today. It is none of the government's business. We have to work these things out for ourselves, and we may not 
not be smart enough to do it, some of us as individuals, but we certainly can't be any dumber than the government, and we at least have our own interests at heart and our own survival at heart, whereas the politicians and the bureaucrats have nothing but their own advancement at, at heart, and yet they are playing with our lives when they do it. JP, thanks so much for calling. Thanks Stay- very much, Harry. I appreciate it. You Just bet. Really quickly, it's funny that you mentioned that because another article states how the USDA is actually going back to the drawing board and redrawing the pyramid. Of course, and then we'll pay for the redrawing. Thanks again. Thanks, Harry. All right, let's talk with Joe in Norfolk, uh, Virginia. Good evening, Joe. Yes, in Norfolk, Virginia. It's a pleasure to hear you and a pleasure to talk to you, Harry. My pleasure. Uh, thanks for waiting so long. Um, you touched on something at the very beginning, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the most overused phrases in the American language today is sending a message. Right. <laughs> and uh, it, it occurred to me that if everyone who said he was going to send a message actually sent a message, Western Union would get back into the telegraph business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. I mean, uh, it, it's a meaningless, it's really a meaningless phrase. And, and people say it and they, they really don't know what it is they're referring to when they say it. But yes, and it usually accompanies some kind of prevailing wisdom that is probably <laughs> dead wrong. And in this case, the message that's being sent is to other corporate executives that we're serious about this. We're going to put you in prison and so forth. And those corporate executives may or may not be doing anything wrong, but the person who's sending the message hasn't got the faintest idea. It's kind of in the same category as uh, one of my other uh, hated phrases. Uh, that is, this is a good first step. Oh yeah. <laughs> when, yeah you hear, right. when you hear that, when you yeah. hear that this is the first good step, you mean it's the first step of many, many steps. Right, and it's used with things like vouchers. Uh, yes, I know government shouldn't be in the school business in the first place, but at least vouchers are a fir- first good step. Well, boy, <laughs> I got news for you. If you could only see what the last step in that uh, progression is, you'd be scared to death. I, I had a discussion. I, I'll get to my main point, I promise, in a second. But I had a discussion with a conservative about vouchers this week, and I was trying unsuccessfully to explain to him why I was opposed to it based on the unalterable conclusion that uh, the government, when they put their money into it, they're going to get involved in it much sooner than later, and it's going to, cor- it's going to corrupt the private system that uh, is such a great alternative to the public system today. It's going to ruin it. Oh, absolutely. It. Yeah, they call it choice, school choice, but the fact is that the last step will be no choice at all because the private schools will become indistinguishable from the government schools once the government has them hooked on government money and can tell them what to do. Joe, if you don't mind staying on the line again for a couple of minutes while we take some commercial breaks here, and then let's get your main point tonight. I'll be happy to. Thanks between what has always been considered a crime in civilized society, crimes against property, crimes against person, rape, murder, robbery, burglary, and crimes that uh, are constituted by whoever happens to be in office at the time, the 535 men in Congress plus the president. The difference between a true crime and what is considered a crime at any particular point in history. And that's what Martha is guilty of, being born at the wrong time. (laughs) <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Yes, you're absolutely right. Richard Mayberry, in his book, Whatever Happened to Justice, clearly makes the point that the English common law, which America inherited, had only two laws. Number one, do all you have promised to do. This is the basis of civil action, meaning that you, if you agreed to do something, then you should do it, whether that's to pay somebody something or to work for somebody or whatever it is. But the second law, which is more relevant to us, is do not intrude on anyone's person or property without his permission. And that is the basis of all real law. If somebody strikes you, if somebody steals something from you, if somebody trespasses on your property without your permission and so on, this is a form of violence, and it should be prosecuted. And you should never, ever be prosecuted for what you own, for what you think, for what you smoke, for what you drink, for what you believe, for what you voluntarily enter into with other people. You should never be prosecuted for any of those things. But if you do violence against somebody else, if you do intrude on somebody's person or property, then, of course, you should be prosecuted, whether or not you do it with a gun, whether or not you're high on drugs, whether or not there's liquor on your breath or hate in your heart. That, that, that All that matters is the violence you have done to somebody else. I, I followed you for many years now, and I, and I really consider you the libertarian master. I mean, you were really great in in explaining things very clearly to people, but this seems to be a sticking point where people base their arguments on the law. Uh, the last, uh, you know, what, I forgot what the saying is, but the... Uh, you mean they base their arguments on what the politicians are telling them right now is exactly. supposed to be the law. Why, yeah. why is this so hard for reasonable, intelligent people to understand that the law can be wrong and the law can be reasonably broken uh, with a clear conscience? Right. Well, one way to approach it is to ask somebody, do you really want to be in the position where there are 10 million laws and you don't know what they are and any prosecutor at any time can decide that you have violated one of them and you're going to go to prison for five years? Is that the kind of society you want to live in or do you want to live in one where you know clearly what is right and what is wrong because it's simple enough for everybody to understand and as long as you stay on the right side of the law, you have nothing to fear? Now, which do you choose? And I don't see how anybody can choose the former over the latter, although some will say, well, it's not that simple. There are shades of gray and so forth and so on. Yes. 
there are shades of gray which inevitably turn black. There is no such thing as a middle way because the middle way always leads to more government. There is no way to get around it. If you say we need a combination of capitalism and socialism, you wind up with socialism. If you say we need uh, a living documents, uh, partly a living document in the Constitution, then you wind up with a dead document, one in which is merely putty in the hands of whatever judge wants to do whatever he wants to do with it. Uh, there is no middle way. There's only one way or the other. Joe, thanks so much Thank for your you, call. Gary. And Enjoyed stay it. with us and enjoy the show and let us hear from you from time to time. Uh, Robert's waiting on the phone, but I want to give you a few of the emails very quickly, and then I'll get to some more emails later in the hour. A good one from Dave in Phoenix says, What is left of the practice of law of the phrase, a jury of your peers? It seems that the criterion used to select juries nowadays, only a completely ignorant person could be guaranteed a jury of his peers. Slick-talking attorneys are free to intimidate and persuade such people of any point of view. Is this what the Founding Fathers had in mind? That's a very, very good point. There is nobody on that jury, I'm sure, who could possibly comprehend what was going on in those financial transactions. I could be wrong about that, but I would be quite surprised to find that I was wrong. And in any of these corporate cases, people who are dragged in off the street are expected to understand all of the intricacies and the complexities that go on in the case. And all we know is that after that's over, the juror can get on television and say, well, we hope this sent a message to those corporate executives. And Dave in Minneapolis, a different Dave, says, you're right about not judging someone we don't know based solely on government statements, media hyperbole, and Jay Leno monologues. Remember the 1996 Olympics, Olympics in Atlanta when a bomb went off in a crowded public place, injuring over 100 people? The primary suspect was a security guard named Richard Jewell. For about a week, everybody in America knew that Jewell was the bomber. But eventually, the Janet Reno Justice Department dropped the charges and pronounced him innocent. A simple, average citizen was needlessly raked over the coals by an entire nation. So why do we automatically believe the worst about Michael Jackson, Martha Stewart, and so on, simply because the politicians and the comedians say so? Well, that's the whole point. You just should not believe these things, no matter how many times you hear them on television. Hey, we got another Dave. Dave in Barrington, Rhode Island, says, in an article by Elizabeth Koch on, in Reason Magazine online, it is mentioned that Martha Stewart herself used to be a stockbroker. And in the article, Elizabeth Koch says, someone asked if Martha's background as a broker was a factor. Absolutely. Chapel, that's the juror, nods. She was a stockbroker, so she should have known the rules. Some of those things she did once she felt the heat show that she should have known better, especially the emissions. Uh, I'm going to interrupt Dave's email there. It may well be that when Martha was a stockbroker, none of these things were factors. None of these things were prosecuted. Getting back to Dave's email, he says, if this is true, we would now know that there was at least one person in the courtroom who knew how stock trading works, meaning Martha Stewart herself. So although I agree that insider trading is a victimless crime, I am sure that even Miss Stewart did not consider trying to argue that the laws against insider trading are bogus. You must recognize that such a defense would probably have been worse than no defense at all against a judge and jury who are surely not sympathetic to the ideas of individual liberty and limited government. Well, I agree with you completely, Dave. If it were I in the courtroom, I certainly wouldn't get up and try to argue that insider trading was not a crime and that should not be a crime. And lastly, uh, for right now, Eric writes and says, Suppose there are no other sellers at $60, and Martha Stewart supposedly had in uh, an order to sell at $60. The current ask is $61. The current bid is $60. I hope you can follow this. I can't show you my hands, and I can't show you the blackboard. But right now, uh, according to Eric's hypothesis here, in the marketplace, the ask price is 61 and the bid price is 60, meaning that a specialist on the stock exchange will sell you the stock if you're willing to pay 61, or he will buy from you if you're willing to sell to him at $60. If Martha does not offer her stock for $60, then there may be no transactions. Anyone who placed the limit order by at 60 might have their buy order expire at the end of the day, meaning that by her inside information, she's offering stock to someone who believes it is worth 60 when Martha knows it is worth less than that. It's sort of like a used car salesman selling a car knowing that its engine is about to fail. In other words, what he's saying is that some poor sucker wound up buying at 60 because Martha Stewart, with her inside information, sold at 60 when otherwise the transaction would not have taken place and the poor sucker would not have seen his order to buy at 60 fulfilled. But the fact is that if there were a stop loss in, the same thing would have happened. The order would have been fulfilled. It wouldn't make any difference why Martha Stewart sold if she was willing to sell at 60. Then the other person is going to buy. And you might think, well, she's got inside information. But I can tell you this. I was in the investment world for 30 years. I'm still in the investment business, but really just on the outskirts of it. But for 30 years, I was knee-deep in it. I was a well-known person. I can't tell you how many people came to me with inside information. And in all the years that I received this inside information, I never acted on any because I was very skeptical of it, and I never saw a single bit of inside information that turned out to be useful. 
I remember before the dollar was devalued. I had written a book called How You Can Profit from the Coming Devaluation when I said that it probably is going to happen sometime between next Saturday and the end of 1991, uh, 1971. The book came out in the spring of 1970. And somebody called me, and he said he had a contact inside the government. This was somebody I knew called me, a stockbroker, and said he had a contact in the government who assured him that the dollar was going to be devalued on a certain particular date, and that it would be ideal to buy gold just before that date. And I won't go into all the mechanics of devaluation, but, boy, this was a sure thing. Of course, it never happened. I think the most glaring example, and I may have used this before on the shows. So if you've heard it before, excuse me, but the most glaring example occurred to a friend of mine back around 1969 or 1970. Gold was around 35 to $40, just fluctuating in that range at the time. Zurich was a leading gold center of the world. It still is. Zurich and London are the two biggest gold trading areas with New York third. And the big three banks in Switzerland, Credit Suisse, Swiss Banking Corporation, Union Bank of Switzerland, were the gold pool in Zurich who managed the gold market. And this friend of mine went to Union Bank of Switzerland and, at my introduction, met the head of the gold department at Union Bank of Switzerland, one of the big three banks that ran the gold pool in Zurich. And my friend said, I want to buy gold. I want to buy a lot of gold. And the gold trader said, why do you want to buy so much gold? And my friend said, because I think it's going to go up uh, sometime soon. And the head of the gold department said, well, you know, it'll fluctuate, and it may get up to $38 or $39 or $40, but it's not going to 50 or 60 or $70. And he said this very authoritatively, and my friend said, well, how can you be so sure that it's not going to go up past $40? And the gold man said, because we control the market. Now, if you ever wanted a tip from the horse's mouth, this was it. The man who was really just about the head of the gold pool in London, in Zurich assured him that gold would never rise above $40. Well, within three years, it was over $100. Within four years, it was at $200. Within 10 years, it was at $800. And, of course, today it's at about $400. So even the head of the gold department at the Union Bank of Switzerland, with all of his inside knowledge of how the gold market is manipulated and all the machinations and so forth, didn't know what he was talking about. My point is that inside information is no better than you doing research on your computer or anything else. Martha Stewart might have been dead wrong. As it turned out, she was wrong in selling, not in the sense that she was wrong in her desire to sell, but wrong, as it turned out, in that Imclone was not in the trouble that they thought it was with the FDI. Well, I'm going to ask Robert in Sarasota to hang on since it's almost time for a break. Let me instead take another email before we go on. Jerry out in cyberspace says, I heard Bill O'Reilly last night say that the government spent from 5 to $10 million of our dollars on the Martha Stewart case. And at most, she made about 230000 from the stock tip. I feel more ripped off by the government than by Martha. Well, you ought to be. Then we have a, an email from Larry out there in California, which is on a different subject. He was reading an article about the coming phony election at lourockwell.com. And... The author took every opportunity to harp on the illegality and immorality of the war, and after a couple of paragraphs, I thought to myself, enough already, give it a rest. And then I realized, what am I saying? Please continue, never stop. It's vital that defenders of liberty work as hard as possible to keep real issues front and center in front of the American people. We can't let up, for surely the big government folks are just as surely unrelenting in trying to distract the American people from these very real problems. In that vein, allow me to suggest the theme of the top ten policies everyone needs to keep hearing about and make it the subject of a show. Of course, I understand uh, that this is... Not something you might want to do, but please consider it. All right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Larry, when I come back, and then we're going to go talk with Robert in Sarasota, Florida. This is Harry Brown. Stay with us. Welcome back. Harry Brown here, and I'm going to postpone my answer to Larry's suggestion about the top ten topics we should keep in front of people so that they don't miss the point, because I've been keeping Robert on the phone for ages here, and let's find out what he has to say. Good evening, Robert, in Sarasota, Florida. My apologies for keeping you waiting so long. Not a problem, Harry. I've just been enjoying listening to the show. And uh, getting a cauliflower ear. Yeah, well, I get a speakerphone, so it's not so bad. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I'm kind of new to the whole political scene, and I, I'm frankly I'm frightened in the direction the, this nation is heading. And the Libertarian Party just seems like it makes the most sense. My question is, if I were to if I were to vote my conscience in a presidential election, I would vote Libertarian. And the, but the last time I voted my conscience was in um, the '96 election, and it kind of backfired on me. Uh, helping Clinton get into office. Um, my question is, I was just kind of interested in what your comments might be on something like that. Um, well, you can't know how anybody is going to turn out, but if you listen to people like George Bush, John Kerry, or any of the other prominent politicians, you know that they're going to increase government, that they're going to increase the intrusions on your life, they're going to multiply the number of laws in this country, and so you have no kickback whatsoever 
if you vote for them, and that's what happens, even though you may have thought, well, this person is not as bad as the other person. With libertarians, you at least know that they are doing this not because they want to get elected so much as they do want to reduce government. Nobody would run as a libertarian for any other reason than the idealistic one of trying desperately to do something to change this country and turn it around and head it back towards smaller and smaller government. And you can't say that about a Republican or Democrat. It may actually be true about some Republican or Democrat, but there's no way that you can know that without some kind of real evidence, as in the case of Ron Paul of Texas, who has consistently voted against all the big government schemes as long as he's been in Congress. So you're not going to elect somebody by voting libertarian, but at least you're not going to be endorsing the very thing that you are trying to prevent, because that's what happens when you vote Republican or Democrat. They don't say you voted for them because they were the lesser of two evils. They say you voted for them because you want all these programs that they're promising that they're going to impose upon you. Um, my other question was, if um, I know you, the party believes in drastic reduction of government. Um, what government you do? I'm just curious. What? How much government do you? Um, I mean, there has to be like roads, and there has to be like somebody to pay for the military and the, you know, law yes. enforcement. Yes. Any any uh, any libertarian that you ask might give you a different answer to the question from what some other libertarian would say. But I think that we can all agree, and whether or not that applies, whether or not we're talking, uh, pardon me, that applies whether or not. We call ourselves libertarians, but I think we can all agree that a very, very important first goal should be to reduce the federal government to its constitutional limits. And that would mean getting the government completely out of welfare, completely out of health care, education, foreign aid, corporate welfare, farm subsidies, and all of these other areas that are not specified in the Constitution and which are specifically prohibited by Articles 9 and 10, which say that anything not specified in the Constitution is not to be done by the federal government. And that would be an important first step. And if we, uh, along with that, change the military to be focused on defense instead of offense, it's supposed to be the Department of Defense, after all, not the Department of remaking Iraq and North Korea and Libya and uh, Syria and all these other countries, but make it the Department of Defense, then we could get by with a budget of $100 billion a year instead of the two point four trillion dollar budget that we now have foisted upon us and we wouldn't need an income tax we wouldn't need a corporate income tax an estate tax or a gift tax we wouldn't need a social security tax we wouldn't need any of these things because the government could get by on just the tariffs and excise taxes already being collected now some people would want to go further than that and if we actually achieve that goal then some people would continue working to reduce the government even further and if you didn't agree with them then you wouldn't have to join them in that but i think that we could all join to begin with in trying to get the government reduced to its constitutional functions as to roads and police and so forth those are not supposed to be federal functions they're supposed to be the functions of state and local government. Does that make sense? Absolutely, and I can only pray that it happens in my lifetime. I do, too, and I know you're a younger man than I am, but I hope that I live long enough with you to see it. Thanks so much for calling, Robert. I appreciate hearing from you. Thank you. All right, we have uh, just a few seconds left in this segment, so let's go ahead and take this break, and when we come back, I'll answer uh, the question from Larry in California, and then we'll get back on the phone again. This is Harry Brown. Stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, Harry Brown here. Let's get back to Larry's email in which he said that there are certain issues that we must keep before the American people and not let them forget, like the war in Iraq and so on, and asked what I thought the top ten issues were, and maybe this should be the subject of a broadcast. Well, Larry, offhand, what I would say is that we must focus on one issue, and it's not really an issue but a principle, and we might use these issues as examples and keep coming back to them. And the one principle is government doesn't work. Government never produces what you want from it. You may want the corporate charlatans to stop doing their dirty work, but government won't do it. The Securities and Exchange Commission was founded in the mid-30s, 65 years ago, almost 70 years ago. It has been in business, and every few years there are corporate scandals, and the SEC gets broad new powers to fight these scandals, and still... The scandals keep coming if they really are scandals. And as I said earlier, I really don't know whether these are true charges, uh, true cases of malfeasance, or just some prosecutor's uh, dream that he's going to elevate himself on the basis of them. But the point is that government has had the authority to fight this for 70 years and never done anything successful about it. Government was uh, doesn't work when it says that it's going to bring peace to some region of the world. It doesn't succeed. Government has not reformed welfare. It has made welfare more expensive. Government has not made health care more accessible and less expensive. It has made it many times as expensive by its intervention, and it has made it many times more difficult to deal with your doctor or a hospital. Government has not made education better. They, the federal government has been feeding money into the system since the early 1960s, and all it has done is to keep coming back year after year and telling us what a sad state the schools are in and asking for more and more money, or not asking, but telling us it's going to spend more and more money. The point is that government doesn't work. There is no principle 
that is more important for people to understand, that whatever it is you want to see happen, you're not going to get it from the government. Even if some politician says, I agree with you completely, and I have introduced a bill to do exactly what you want, that's not the bill that will eventually pass. It will be amended all over the place. And once it's amended, it will serve as a precedent to expand itself many times over into areas not intended by you and which, in fact, may do exactly the opposite of what you had in mind in the first place. And the bureaucrats who administer it will use it for their own ends, not for the purpose you had in mind. And when it goes into court to be adjudicated on some controversy, the judges will decide it on the basis of what they think society should be like, not what you think society should be like. And if people could simply understand that government doesn't work, that it never delivers on its promises, that it never gives you what you really want, unless you are a lobbyist, unless you are somebody who intends to get rich on government contracts, then if people could understand that government doesn't work, and really understand it down deep inside, then for once you would not have to argue with them anymore about any specific issue. Now, we do use specific issues as examples that government doesn't work and hope that at some point the individual can generalize enough from all the previous examples to realize that the next example falls into the same category. All right, let's talk with Ray in Lakehead, California now. Ray, you still with us? Yeah. Thanks so much for waiting. All righty. Uh, I want to bring a point together. You know, if you're in business like that, uh, Martha Stewart was, mm -hmm. and you make a decision, then you have this big government jumping on your back because they don't like what you did, and I don't think that's not being very good for the people in business. No, it certainly isn't, or for their customers or for the people who work for them. Right, and another thing I might uh, want to make a point about is when St. Patrick drove all the snakes out of Ireland, <laughs> they all wound up in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered where you were going with that. <laughs> well, that's where I'm going with it. <laughs> okay, they made it all the way across the ocean to Washington, D.C., yeah, that Ted Kennedy is one of the biggest snakes. <laughs> well, I am nonpartisan. I find snakes on both sides of the aisle. Well, they are. They are. I'll agree with you 100%. You know, another thing about all these aliens crossing the border and the military coming in from Mexico with all their uh, equipment and stuff, that's kind of like an act of war on America, isn't it? Well, I guess so if they're on the side of the border, but then it's just uh, simple justice given that our military is in so many countries around the world, and our military has gone into Mexico more times than you can possibly count. And I'm not talking just about recent years chasing supposed drug dealers and so on. I mean, our government has been doing it for the last century. Woodrow Wilson, that great man of peace, actually sent our Navy to Veracruz to try to overthrow the new government of Mexico at that particular time. It's been going on for a century, so it's just tit for tat when we find foreign troops in this country. Yeah, well, what I figured out, if they want to worry about protecting our borders and build a, build a giant bug zapper fence out of anchor type fence and put signs all over there and they can't get across unless they go through the regular border crossing. All I can tell you is it won't work. <laughs> uh, all I can tell you is that even if you could build such a fence around your property, the government would not build such a fence that would work around the United States of America. The people are going to keep coming. If you want to keep the wrong people out of this country, then change the policies of this country so that there's no free welcome wagon waiting for them at the border. And that's the only way we're ever going to stem what we think of maybe as bad immigration. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much for calling, Ray. Appreciate yeah. hearing from you. Let's go now to New Orleans and talk with Rex. Good evening, Rex. Good evening. I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, a quick parallel between Arthur Anderson and Martha Stewart. Okay. Martha Stewart, not only did the day of the verdict, it cost the little people whose name the action was bought almost $2 billion worth of lost stock prices. But then, to put Martha Stewart Incorporated and Kmart Incorporated at risk, if that falls, how many other thousands of little people are going to lose their jobs? But let's go to Arthur Anderson. Here they didn't find a single big kid guilty, right, because it was too time-consuming. They wanted to score political points. And so the judge gave a directed verdict to the jury. They had to find the corporation guilty. So who got hurt? All the senior partners just went over to other firms. Who got fired? All the little people. Over 5,000 secretaries, key punch operators, file clerks, paralegals, etc. right? All in the name of the little people. Yeah, very, very good point. And, of course, they will not acknowledge that, though. They will say that it was the corporate officials that caused all this harm. Okay, to hey, people. Let me tell you, you know, if I were a king, if I, first of all, I would have the chief prosecutor, if not uh, Ashcroft, the chief prosecutor who bought that action. Okay, You're supposed to have judicial discretion. Now, now let, let's say, not a single individual was found guilty in Arthur Anderson. The corporation was found guilty. That's like saying, oh, okay, so somebody murdered somebody in Cincinnati, so we're going to find everybody in the United States guilty. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, So and send them to jail. The part, so who lost their jobs? The little people. Who wasn't hurt? The guilty people, they just walked. They went to another firm. Mm -hmm. 
So, and the same with Martha Stewart. I mean, at your point, you, that's beating a dead horse, of course. But once again, and this was all done in the name of the little people. And when they talk, uh, as they have been the last 24 hours, about these corporations where people lost tremendous amounts of money in their 401ks because they were holding those corporation stock and so on, it was never really distinguished whether the money was lost before the government moved in or the money was lost after the government moved in and besmirched the corporation so that the stock plummeted. Well, exactly. And you see that in the case of when they tried to indict her for, for, for an effect, uh, uh, maintain her innocence, and therefore yeah. they, they thought that was, a, you know, and maintain your stock rights. Like, so, so, so the little people should lose value, right? Yeah, you know, that's a good point, too. And if, if there were nothing else about this case to make you wonder what in the world was going on, that they actually wanted to charge her with uh, fraud right. by, by professing her ignorance, uh, then you know that from now on in America, you can't say, I'm not guilty, because if it turns out you're proven guilty, then you can be sued, you can be fined, you can be further imprisoned for just maintaining your innocence. And, uh, oh, I, yeah. and another quick point. She didn't do ins insider trading. Is only if Sam, what's his name, called her directly, and she sold. It's only if Sam called the stockbroker and the stockbroker sold his stock. Yes. Not insider trading. If the stockbroker called her and said, "Hey, Sam is selling." Okay? Right. There was no. Ins that's that's never been the law. Well, as a matter of fact, there really is no law against insider trading because they don't want to define exactly what it is. If they once define what it is, then people could just stay out of the way of the law by not doing what is a violation sure, of the law. Well, they, yeah. they want the latitude to be able to prosecute anybody that they don't well, like. That's the Red Queen theory, right? Absolutely, and it is the rule of men and not the rule of law, and that is a primary well, violation of what America well, was meant to be. Congress has never been able to define the difference between debt and equity in the law. Well, uh, I, I'm not surprised. I don't think they know what the difference is. Well, they, keep, they keep telling us they have cut the budget when the budget goes well, up. But I'm talking in terms of stock price. You, Congress cannot define what financial instrument is debt and what financial instrument is equity. Mm -hmm. They cannot come to a conclusion. They have never been in the history to, to this date. Okay, so you have this terrible gray area in which the IRS can come in and say, well, you committed fraud because you said this instrument was a debt instrument, but it's really a... See, there are so many things that Congress can't make up its mind about, all right, which is, means it's all political in the final analysis anyway. Of or, course. as Humpty Dumpy said, the question is, who shall rule? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, thanks so much, Rex. A lot of good points. And check in with us from time to time. I like hearing from you. Hey, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. I think it would be a mistake to call in now. We won't be able to take any more calls. What I'm going to do in the rest of this segment is to cover a few more emails and perhaps into the next segment and then wrap this up. A uh, nice message from Joe somewhere out in cyberspace. He says, I thought you might enjoy this one. And it's a quote from the late I.F. Stone. Every government is run by liars and nothing they say should be believed. Well, wow. That's kind of extreme, isn't it, I.F. Stone? Well, now that I think about it, you're probably right. And Beaker out in cyberspace says, you mentioned that Martha Stewart was convicted of lying to government officials. The crime of lying to law enforcement officials is especially hypocritical when you consider that these same law enforcement officers are legally entitled to lie to us. For example, when interrogating suspects, police officers are legally entitled to lie to the suspect in an effort to make him confess. A detective can falsely tell you that your DNA was found at the crime scene, that your partner in crime has already ratted you out, or that you'll get a lighter sentence if you confess right away. Just one more example of government's shameless double standards. Very good point, Beaker. I'll add to that that everybody who works in narcotics is taught to lie, to pose as a drug dealer, to create sting operations, which are nothing more than fraud, than lying to people in an attempt to try to entrap them, to try to tempt them into breaking the law. And uh, as you say, this is a double standard. Well, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, and we'll have some final thoughts on all of this. Stay with me. This is Harry Brown.